Hello, welcome to Coffee Break with Microchip Technology. Coffee Break is our forum to discuss trending topics and ideas of interest in about the amount of time it takes to drink a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, or your other favorite beverage. Our topic today is timing in 5G networks. I'm your host, Eric Glattfelter. Joining us today is Jim Olson, a solutions architect here at Microchip. Welcome, Jim. Hi, Eric. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Coffee Talk. Thanks again for joining us. Also with us is Jesse Nichols. Jesse, can you inform our audience how they can interact with us during Coffee Break today? Absolutely. Hello, gentlemen. Uh, hello from the booth. Um, unfortunately, we are not live streaming today. We had some technical difficulties, so this is pre-recorded. But we'll get back right on that uh, in episode three. Um, you can always uh, place your questions in the chat, and our experts will be there to answer those questions. You can send them a live stream at microchip.com. That's also an option. And always remember to like, subscribe, and follow us. Back to you guys. All right, great. So into our topic, timing in 5G networks. Now, Jim, a 5G network is an unbelievably complicated system, and many of the subsystems themselves are extremely complicated. How important is timing in managing the 5G network? Eric, timing plays an important role in the seamless operation of these wireless communications computers that we use every day. The impact of timing not meeting the requirements falls into two categories. The first category with drop calls on mobile handoffs is a frequency requirement. And interference between overlapping radios in the same spectrum is a timing phase alignment requirement between the radios. So when you say something like interference, you're talking about potentially somebody trying to watch coffee break and live stream and getting unintended buffering. That's not, that's not acceptable, right? Yeah, Eric, that's, that's not acceptable. And TDE technology requires the radios to transmit and they're assigned time slots properly. And if they do not, it results in interference. And that's because the underlying fundamental technology for 5G radios, time division duplex, means the uplink and downlink share the same frequency band. So timing issues do result in interference and degradation of services such as buffering uh, on streaming events and other related issues. Okay. But the momentum today for 5G timing architectures is moving towards network-based timing solutions such as PTP or precision time protocol. And, and in this 5G architecture, the poor quality of the oscillators in the 5G new radios, low performance, low cost oscillators, have an impact on timing architectures, and we'll talk about more about that a little bit later. Okay. Now, I assume that uh, in the 5G network, there's going to be a very stringent timing budget. Um, is that correct? And can you, t can you walk us through what that budget looks like? Yes, that is correct. And when we use network-based timing solutions, such as PTP, we allocate a timing error budget to the end end-to-end -end applications. So in 5G, the timing error is plus or minus 1.5 microseconds to absolute time. So we allocate it into three sectors, the source of time, the transport network, and the end application. For the source of time, we use GNSS GPS-based timing receivers, which, is, which are called primary reference time clocks. Primary reference time clocks have industry standard categories. We have PRTCA, which is tracking within 100 nanoseconds accuracy to UPC time, PRTCB within 40 nanoseconds, and EPRTC or enhanced PRTC within 30 nanoseconds. The EPRTC uses a co-located cesium standard so that if the EPRTC GNSS GPS functions become compromised, 
we can maintain PRTCA accuracy for more than two weeks without GNSS or GPS reception. The transport network has also allocated the largest portion of the total time error budget. And in the switches and routers, the boundary clock classes also have industry standard specifications. And the better your boundary clock performance, the longer we can extend the timing chain of the, of the switches and routers in the timing path. The end application falls into two categories. You have the SIPRI category, which is the common public radio interface application where we send timing over the SIPRI link from the baseband units to the radios themselves. For this application, we allocate 400 nanoseconds of the timing error budget to this SIPRI model. For eSIPRI with 5G new radios, where the PTP clients are in the radios themselves, we allocate 80 nanoseconds of the total time error budget. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the source of time. Can you tell us a little bit more about the PRTC standards? Sure, Eric. And we have some examples here of different PRTC models. The first timing model we show here is a PRTC-A model. In this model, we show basically the GNSS GPS timing receiver function co-located with the 5G radios themselves in a cell site location. For this application, PRTCA is all that's needed because we don't need to reduce the time error of the PRTC function due to the close proximity of the PRTC to the radios themselves. If we look at timing model number two, which is an Ethernet front hall model, we also can use a PRTCA function because once again, we're in fairly close proximity to the radios. In this case, we may go through two, three, or four boundary clock switches between the PRTC function and the PTP clients in the radios themselves. However, it's important to understand how PTP compensates for the poor quality of the oscillators in the 5G new radios. PTP can be used as a primary or as a backup. And for an example, as a backup, if the 5G radios had GPS or GNS integrated receivers, we would still want the network-based PTP timing service because if the GNSS or GPS is compromised in the radios, the oscillators in the radios cannot provide the holdover function required to maintain the timing and phase for the radios. So we would have to use the network-based PTP timing service as a backup. But the momentum is moving towards using PTP network-based timing services as the primary and only methodology because if the GNSS or GPS timing is compromised in the PRTCA function in this model and it starts drifting from UTC time, all of the radios will drift at the same rate and in the same direction, thus avoiding interference, making a network-based timing service with PTP as the most desirable technical model. All right. And how about the other variants of the PRTC standard? Yes, we have uh, a third model we're showing here, which is called the Virtual Primary Reference Time Clock, or Virtual PRTC. This is a concept and not an industry standard. In this model with the virtual PRTC, we want to have the source of time for the source clocks be EPRTC or EPRTCB uh, type functions because the objective is to produce a PRTCA function within 100 nanoseconds of UTC at the aggregation sites shown here in the illustration. So we must reduce the PRTC error budget allocation so we can maintain that 100 nanoseconds of accuracy at the aggregation points. In a virtual PRTC model, we have an east-west source of time location where we send PTP flows in a bi-directional fashion. This bi-directional timing is redundant so that if we have a fiber cut in one direction, we can take timing and traffic from the opposite direction. 
So this is very resilient, redundant operation. And we can also put the sources of time long distances over many numbers of hops using high performance boundary clocks to the aggregation points where we have a southbound interface delivering 100 nanoseconds of accuracy to our radio clusters of 5G radio technology. I think the most important point to understand about the virtual PRTC is that this gives wireless operators an alternative to distributed GNSS GPS timing architectures with a more centralized architecture that provides very high performance with redundancy and resiliency. All right, well, thanks for that overview, Jim. Now, there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle, uh, not to mention an awful lot of acronyms. Um, can you give our viewers an overview of the types of technology that are needed to manage timing across the 5G network? Yes, Eric, and I think the objective of, of a lot of this wireless stuff is to produce as many acronyms as possible. <laughs> but microchip timing technology maps to 5G timing architectures in the core, the aggregation, and the access. Microchip makes everything from cesium and rubidium atomic clocks to source clocks, GNSS, GPS timing receivers to PRTCA, PRTCB, EPRTC clock sources. We make PTP servers, gateway clocks grand, with grandmaster functions. We also make components for boundary clock functions and high performance boundary clocks, as well as PTP clients, associated software, and oscillators for source clocks and 5G new radios themselves. So Microchip has uh, lots of solutions. And if you want to learn more about the Microchip solutions or 5G architectures, visit the Microchip website. All right. Thanks again, Jim, for that overview. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll go to Jesse in the booth now. Jesse, are there questions uh, for Jim and our other experts? Hey, guys. Um, yes, there are actually a few questions here. Um, one of them is, how does the cesium improve the holdover performance of the EPRTC? Uh, Jesse, that's a good question. So a cesium um, atomic clock is an autonomous reference, so it needs no external input but it's a frequency device. So we can attach that frequency device to a GNSS timing receiver, and we use EPRTC algorithms to measure the offset of the phase error accumulation between the GNSS receiver and the cesium atomic clock. Over time, we learn that offset very well, so we're able to make corrections with our algorithms to maintain UTC traceable time when GNSS or GPS is compromised. So we can hold UTC traceable time with the cesium for several weeks or even months. And this technology is certainly in the realm of cool technology. So if there's any technology nerds like me out there, you really appreciate this sort of uh, cool technology. Great, great. Um, we do have another question here. Are there other network related issues that degrade timing accuracy other than switches? Uh, that's a good question and the answer is yes. In addition to time error mitigation in the switches, we have to be concerned with additional asymmetry that creates time error from the network itself. For example, if the PTP flows for network-based timing are reside on two different fibers from the forward and reverse direction, those fibers may be different lengths. They may not exactly be, be the same length, which creates additional time error and asymmetry. As well as the network interfaces themselves, rate conversions, SFPs, and other things also cause additional asymmetry or time error and those need to be calculated into the calculations for the time error budget when we use network-based PTP timing services for 5G architectures as well. All right, thank you, Jim. Uh, looks like we do have one more question here. Um, could you use both a GNSS and PTP input on a PRTC device? 
You bet, Jesse. That's another good question. And there's a technology, it's a standards-based uh, technology called APTS, which is Assisted Partial Timing Support, where, yes, you can have GNSS or GPS as the primary reference to a PRTC, but you can also have a PTP input coming from another PTP server located at a different point in the network. In this application, since we have GNSS or GPS initially running at both locations, we can measure the asymmetry between those two locations very, very accurately. So if we lose GNSS or GPS at the far end location, we can create a GNSS or GPS proxy by using automatic asymmetry calibration algorithms. So we can maintain UTT's traceable time if we lose GNSS or GPS or it's compromised with APTS technology. And again, this technology follows into the realm of really cool technology. Very good, Jim. Uh, you know, it seems like this is a pretty complex topic, so I bet there are some uh, viewers out there um, that have other questions. That's all we have right now, but you can put them in at livestream at microchip.com, and we will definitely get back to you on that. Um, remember to like and subscribe and follow us, and that's all we got, guys. Back to you, Eric. Thanks, Jesse, and thank you, Jim, for sharing your expertise. Most of all, thank you to our audience for joining us. If you enjoyed this, uh, please visit us at microchip.com slash coffee break. There you can access previously recorded sessions of Coffee Break, and more importantly, you can see our agenda of upcoming topics. You'll be able to add them directly to your calendar or subscribe for updates. So thank you again. We hope this information is useful to you as you work to create something great. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye.